Taking a tough stance on China seems to be a mainstay in American elections, and the 2012 campaign is no exception. In fact, many political observers agree that the anti-China rhetoric in the 2012 presidential election took on a much harsher tone than in years past. I recently sat down with Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who served as the United States National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter from 1977 to 1981 and is now a senior scholar at the Center for Strategic and International Studies to discuss the impact of this rhetoric on U.S.-China relations. I began by asking if he believes that the anti-China rhetoric reached a new level on the campaign trail in 2012. It really started, I think, quite recently and largely as a consequence of China's rise and its appearance on the international economic scene as a major economic power and therefore increasingly perceived by Americans first as a business opportunity and then secondly perhaps as a threat to our employment, to our exports and so forth. And then last but not least, the American elections. American elections involve a process in which complex issues are deliberately oversimplified. And I think we're seeing that particularly in any serious discussion of China. So I just want to run through some of these. Now, Mitt Romney uh, says he's pledged on his first day in office, he's going to do these things. He's going to label China a currency manipulator, crack down on Chinese cheating on everything from intellectual property violations to trade practices, and determine what should be cut from the federal spending based on whether the U.S. has to borrow from China to pay for it. Is any of this viable? Well, you miss, some items, you miss some items <laughs> because he also <laughs> okay. is going to move the capital rec a recognition of, you know, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is going to create, of course, a big flap with the Arabs. And I forget what else he's promised, but he's promised quite a bit. Something about the defense budget, too, I think. So what does this do for the relationship, though, in terms of uh, escalating tensions? You know, I'm critical, of course, of these things, and I think they're deplorable. Uh, they're counterproductive to our national interest. But at the same time, we also have to recognize the fact that some of the responsibility for this rests with the Chinese. I mean, they aren't little angels sitting there and simply being hurt by our abuse or threats. I read their regular press. I read what their public opinion shapers say. I read what their strategists write. And there's a lot of hot anti-American stuff now circulating on a daily basis in China, in which uh, the Chinese well, are bragging about their growth, uh, describing America as aggressive, threatening, and so forth. So my advice to both leaderships is to cool it. Uh, I think we have a unique chance, and more than that, a unique obligation, historically, to make it possible for two world powerful states to coexist and collaborate because history normally indicates that they will get into a fight but I don't believe that's possible anymore I believe if that were to happen it would be suicidal mutually so we have a joint interest in avoiding that so if you're the incumbent and you're constantly getting assailed on how you deal with China and you're Obama does this mean that you have to pivot in a different direction well put yourself in his shoes you want to be reelected. Your opponent is saying you're soft, and he's uttering all sorts of threats against the Chinese in the hope that people here back home will vote for him. That should concern you, shouldn't it? And he would have to be superhuman not to be tempted in some respects, perhaps even to compete. What about the dangers of something like this, though? If Governor Romney were to win the presidency, wouldn't he have to spend a significant amount of his time, early on at least in his administration, walking back from these statements? Well, I agree with you entirely, and this is why I do think that the electoral campaign, unfortunately, results in a discussion that is basically counterproductive to our national interests. And that's just a fact of life. It's in part a product of the competitive urge between the two candidates. Uh, to score points, but it's also a function of the fact that our public, by and large, to be perfectly blunt but accurate, is woefully ignorant about the world. And an public, a public that's ignorant tends to be very susceptible to demagogy. Uh, Jeffrey Bader, who worked in the Obama administration, was quoted recently as saying that uh, when it comes to these negative ads, they're an attempt to manipulate American emotions rather than activate their brains. Agree? Absolutely. 
Do the Americans not want to have their brains activated? Well, they have their brains, but they're focused on other things. First of all, you know, making a living. And the economy isn't in the best shape, so people are more worried about those aspects. But beyond that, you know, what do Americans really are interested in? Sports? Television, uh, what do you call them? Not comedies, but you know, there's a net term for it, for television programs. Reality television? Yeah, something like that, you know, these sort of ent television entertainment. That's basically it, isn't it? So you're saying it's just easier to simplistically boil things down? If you're an average American living somewhere outside of either New York, Chicago, Washington, Boston, maybe LA or San Francisco, how do you get your news? There aren't newspapers there in those other places which give you world news. So first of all, you don't read it as part of your reading of the newspaper. Even if most people turn first to the sports page, they would still see the headline if it dealt with these issues. So they don't have access. Secondly, news on American television. How often is it really news? We do have three major programs every evening. World news, whatever else is called on the major head networks. But if you look at the content, well, what, two or three minutes maybe on the, the world news and the rest, human interest stories, some sensational events, lately a lot of medical <laughs> advice, <laughs> and some other sort of socially interesting phenomenon. There are kind of 25-minute uh, packaging for, for two minutes of news. So if you have four years in office and you're running for re-election that last year, and then let's say you win that first year, you have to mend fences. How much time do you really have to create a viable relationship? Well, you're, you're describing an operational liability of our democratic system. But I repeat, it's rooted not in the democratic system as such, but in the basic ignorance of the electorate. If we had a more sophisticated electorate that really was exposed to some useful understanding of international affairs that was taught in high schools about global history. In this particular case, let's say the very complex but impressive Chinese history. That was also taught geography. So they would know where places are on the world map, which most Americans do not. I think we wouldn't be hearing some of these things. Because basically these things stem from the fact that it's easier to mobilize the public by appealing to their instinctive prejudices and resentments, some of which may be even justified, then by seriously discussing, let's say, the issue of how to great, how to two great powers set the precedent of sustained coexistence and maybe even partnership in a world in which they stand head and shoulders above all other powers. You know, in the 20th century, 20th century was a tragic century in international affairs. Why? Because it was dominated almost the entire century by two protracted conflicts in order to, for the sake of achieving global hegemony. By Hitlerite Germany, by Stalinist Russia. I don't think we want to repeat that. I don't think we should. I don't think we can, because if we move in that way, Everybody will suffer, including ourselves.